water. We need it for our foods. If anybody likes to eat, this is something you should care about. And for basic survival. You don't escape this situation. It is, it is smothering us like a blanket. But what happens when we run out of fresh water? We just need water, and without water, it it's just doesn't work. When Mother Nature doesn't deliver what's needed. At some point, our children will have to move from the community because there's not water for them. When governments shut off water because there's not enough in reserve. We get criticized because permanent crops are permanent and they require water every year. As the Western United States faces its worst drought conditions ever. I think it's really unlikely that Lake Powell ever gets this high again. What's being done to help now? It's gonna take all of us. To come up with a solution, it's gonna take all of us. And to preserve or generate life-saving water for future generations. We live in a hungry world. And, uh, you know, there are going to be 9 billion people on this planet by 2060. And uh, they're all going to want to eat. This is Drying Up, a look at the Western water crisis. The threat of raging wildfires is now a year-round problem brought on by the lack of rain. Just an ominous sign of things to come. I'm meteorologist Bill Bellis reporting from Lake Mead, Nevada, just east of Las Vegas. This is the largest man-made reservoir delivering water to nearly 25 million people in the West. But it's drying up as part of a mega drought. And scientists say it's the worst drought across the West in 1,200 years. Yes, 1,200 years. Almost 50% of the country faces extreme drought this year. Lands drying up and burning up. The whole community is burned. Fires so powerful this summer, satellite imagery captured this fire cloud from space. The McKinney Fire raced through parts of Northern California, charring tens of thousands of acres and claiming lives along the way. It's really hard to, to look at it and accept. Forest Service guy knocked on my door and said, out now. Thousands of people evacuated as dry lands paired with blistering heat fueled a fire at Yosemite National Park this summer. Meteorologist Mike Kruger. As we are developing more homes, more communities in these forests, we are protecting those homes. We are stopping fires that in their tracks. And as a result, forests are getting denser. And as a result of that, the fires are burning hotter. More families likely to be affected as the lack of water causes a worsening drought. We're seeing that we're in essentially a 23-year-long drought, and it's continuing. University of Nevada Las Vegas climatologist Matthew Lanchonette says the problem is only expected to get worse. Take a look at these drought maps. You can see there was almost no drought in 2019 thanks to an El Nino weather pattern resulting in above-normal snowfall. In 2020, drought conditions begin as the La Nina weather pattern settles in, and by 2021, exceptional drought conditions across the region. What's making the situation worse on a faster pace than ever in the West? The problem centers on three issues. Snowpack and the melting we see, soil moisture and how much water the dry soil absorbs, and temperatures driving how much water evaporates before it even reaches our lakes, streams, reservoirs, and local water supplies. Our team of weather experts will help us explain more. We begin with the snowpack problem and meteorologist Lindsay Stores in Salt Lake City. Winter snowfall is crucial for summer water sources here in the West. Taking a look at the snowfall for the past three years, it's a case of the haves and the have-nots. The haves being the Pacific Northwest and the Northern Rockies. Those reds and purples indicate the areas getting the most snow. The Great Basin and the Desert Southwest have been getting the least amount of snow. To illustrate this, take a look at a few cities, starting with Salt Lake City, where we have had below normal snowfall each year for the past three years. Reno similar. Reno's picked up 13 and a half to 17 and a half inches of snow each winter when they should have had about 22. But if you go just a little farther to the north in Boise, the past two winters, they've received above normal snowfall, which has really helped the drought situation out there. As the snow melts, that water begins its path toward our water supply sources. Colleague Matt Monroe continues from Reno, Nevada. 
Let's take a look at total annual precipitation and really see the progression of this drought. Now, the latest round of severe drought actually began right here in 2017. Western Four Corners, Southern Nevada, Southern California. Those yellow and oranges mean below average precip. Look what happens here in 2018. Just about everybody here in the West goes below average. There was a bit of a rebound here in 2019 at or above average precip with the exception of the Pacific Northwest. And then everybody goes downhill again here in 2020. 2021, not much better, and this past winter was absolutely terrible. Look at the reds here in Nevada and California. That's less than 20% of the precip that we normally get during a winter. Now, when you examine precipitation, you also have to take a look at evaporation and also temperatures, and not just daily temperatures, but temperatures over a long period of time. We call that a trend. For more on that, let's go to my colleague Roland Stedham in Boise, Idaho. When it comes to weather, nature is always trying to achieve balance, but it's impossible because the Earth is a sphere. There's always more energy and sun at the equator than the northern latitudes. It's nature's effort to create balance is the reason that we have weather, and sometimes things do get a little out of alignment. It's been hotter than average in the southwestern part of the country by about 3 to as much as 10 degrees. Las Vegas average high in July, 105 degrees. We've seen a couple of readings already at 100 and 12. Has this cycle happened before? It has. Boise, Idaho, the hottest temperature ever, 111 in 1898, 108 in 1931, 107 in 1876. One of the places the extreme drought is most visible and devastating are the many farms that are the backbone of our food supply. Without the hardworking men and women who grow the vast majority of the fresh food we eat, we can't survive. But those farmers are facing a crisis from Mother Nature to governments restricting their water supply. Our Liz Gonzalez reports from Central California. It's one of the most productive farming regions of the world, now also starving for water. We live in a hungry world. Mark Borba is a fourth generation farmer. He takes pride in feeding and clothing the world from this land in California's Central Valley. Our crop map now is almonds, uh, pistachios, processing tomatoes, lettuce, garlic, melons, some Pima cotton. From Oregon. You don't escape this situation. It is, it is smothering us like a blanket. To Idaho. We need snow. We need a snowpack. The drought is hitting the ag industry hard. Last year, I had to start feeding hay in August. That's unheard of. I normally wouldn't have to start that until November. Along the Sierra Nevada, there was barely any snow to measure by the spring. But in California, farmers aren't just getting dealt a bad hand from Mother Nature. State and federal governments have slashed surface water deliveries to farms. And some of the water left is going to the ocean instead of farms and people. Dictated by environmental orders meant to preserve populations of fish and to keep salt water out. Growers are also under orders from the state to set aside some of their farmland to replenish underground water storage. Growers with Westland's water district followed around 200,000 acres last year. To put that in perspective, that's about five times the size of Washington, D.C., six and a half times the size of San Francisco and they're expecting to fallow even more this year, and they're blaming the water policies in place. One study estimates close to a million acres could be fallowed in California alone over the next three decades, with losses estimated to be at least $7.2 billion per year. A census by the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 2017 found 710,000 acres were fallowed in Oregon. 47,000 in Nevada, 306,000 in Idaho, and 115,000 in Utah. California farmers say they wouldn't be in this position if the state had adequate surface storage. Groundwater pumping is an option, but not always a good one. This white stuff on top of the ground here, that's from the well water. That's salts, uh, principally sodium, that has been pumped from the wells. The high price of fuel isn't helping either. Some farmers in Oregon use diesel-generated pumping systems. So I'm essentially having to buy my land twice for the sake of being able to grow a crop on it to turn a profit. Farmers are, uh, are tough. They, they don't give up easy. When farmers suffer, we all feel the pain at the grocery store and in our farmers' markets. The U.S. Department of Food and Agriculture reports 80% of U.S. produced fruits, nuts, and veggies are grown west of the Rockies. 
Water-hungry California alone produces about half of all the fruits, nuts, and veggies consumed in the U.S. Continued water shortages and drought will drive up food costs even higher than they are today. Anything fresh or made from fresh foods could spike. Financial experts say the price increase we see at the grocery store will trail the worst of the water crisis and drought for growers. The drought may end at some point, but food prices will not peak until later. We are standing in the country's largest reservoir where water levels are at historic lows. Lake Mead in Nevada is certainly not the only crisis spot. Still to come, we take you across the West to examine other major water supplies and the search for solutions. What can we do to ensure what continues to flow? Welcome back. As water levels continue to fall here at Lake Mead, some surprising findings are popping up. Among them, bodies. The first set of human remains was found inside a barrel on May 1st, but it doesn't end there. Several other sets of remains have been found in the weeks that followed. The investigations into who these people were continue. And it's not just bodies. A sunken boat dating back to World War II has emerged from shrinking Lake Mead. It was used to survey the Colorado River decades ago, sold to the marina, and then sunk, according to the Nevada Scuba Diving Company, the company used to conduct dive tours to the boat. This type of boat is called a Higgins Landing Craft, and many were deployed at Normandy on June 6, 1944, also known as D-Day. The National Park Service says a number of distant cousins to the Higgins boat are in use daily at the lake for servicing remote campsites and beaches. And take a look at this. How about an unexpected kayak adventure on Lake Shasta in Northern California? What you're seeing here are kayakers floating through an abandoned train trestle and tunnel that normally sit 150 feet underwater. They were built by the Southern Pacific in the late 1800s and later abandoned when the reservoir was built in the 1940s. Falling lake levels now provide enough clearance for kayakers to pass through this hidden gem, something that's only happened a handful of times in Shasta's lake nearly 80 year history. We are seeing a population explosion in many cities and towns here in the West and everyone needs water. But just how much is that population boom deepening our water crisis? Our look at the Western water crisis continues after this. Welcome back. As I stand here on the banks of Lake Mead, it's easy to point out the unsightly bathtub rings. But Lake Mead isn't alone. Many of our western reservoirs are at critical levels. From here, the Colorado River system to the reservoir and canals across California. Lauren Clark shows us why the level of concerns continue to rise as water levels continue to fall. 30 or 40 million people rely on the Colorado River. Uh, the river is what's allowed the, the development of the Southwest. The bloodline of the Southwest. The heart of what millions in six states depend on as reservoirs store and deliver water from the mighty Colorado River, two of the most important, Lake Mead outside of Las Vegas and Lake Powell in northern Arizona and southern Utah. But a quick glimpse of the latter shows all is not well, says Bob Martin with the Bureau of Reclamation. Well, behind me, you're, you're seeing the, the effects of a 22-year drought. Lake Powell, now only 25% full, with nearby Lake Mead at 27%. In just 20 years, NASA's satellites showing the startling difference at Lake Mead, dropping more than 170 feet since the 80s. Lake Powell is a savings account and Lake Mead is a checking account. And if your lifestyle is is bigger than what your income is, you know, you have to draw from your savings to support that lifestyle. And that's, as you can see behind me, that's what we've done for the last 22 years. In California, Lake Shasta is sitting at just 37% full and Lake Isabella running low too. And check out this map from data visualists at UNC Chapel Hill. Red circles highlighting some of our most prominent reservoirs across the West at critical levels. For Bob, it's a troubling 
an unsettling reminder. Like looking at the scoreboard at, at a game and, you know, you're constantly behind. At times it gets disheartening. While water levels are at historic lows out west, the population is soaring to record levels. Will more people lead to a far greater demand for water in the future? Daniel Woodruff is in southern Utah for us, and he begins our look at desperate search for solutions to the water crisis. Did you see there were fish in here? It's starting to feel like home for Joe and Diane Franzi. You kind of wake up and every day it seems like blue skies. It seems like paradise, really. The Franzis just moved to St. George, Utah, a desert oasis in the southwestern corner of the state. Kept checking the boxes of things that we wanted. Like the weather, St. George stays sunny and warm nearly year-round. It's a popular vacation spot, but more and more people are choosing to call it home. St. George's population jumped more than 4% in a year, according to the latest census numbers. Among larger cities, it was the fastest growing one in Utah and the 20th fastest growing in the entire country. Experts who study growth with the U.S. Census Bureau say this is part of a larger trend of people flocking to this part of the country. We're definitely seeing uh, population growth in the West. From 2020 to 2021, Utah, Idaho, Montana, and Arizona ranked top four in the country for the highest population change. Nevada, Oregon, Washington State, Colorado, and Wyoming also saw their populations jump. Only California and New Mexico lost population during that same period. But all this growth comes with a price. And it's paid with what some are starting to call liquid gold. When you think about growth here and water, what do you most lose sleep about at night? <laughs> that at some point our children will have to move from the community because there's not water for them. Zachary Renstrom manages the Water Conservancy District in southwestern Utah, which includes Sand Hollow Reservoir. It's a resource critical to growth. This is what's driving our economy. This is what's allowing us to build homes today. If we did not have this reservoir today, then we would have, we would have stopped all of growth here about 20 years ago. Um, every kid would have had to move away from the community if it wasn't for this one sole object. So what more can be done and when? My colleague Lincoln Graves continues from Lake Powell, a water source for six states in the southwest. You can see over on the left there, the old boat ramp. Few people know Lake Powell better than Eric Balkan of the Glen Canyon Institute. He takes us on a tour to show us the effects of drastically low water levels. And they extended it and then they built like a, a spur off to the side and then that's now beached as well. The Institute has a clear agenda, long advocating for the decommissioning of Glen Canyon Dam and restoration of a free-flowing Colorado River. But as they've pushed for that, they've seen drought take hold, affecting water levels in the two biggest reservoirs of the Colorado River system. Main reservoirs, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, they were built to catch excess water, and there is no more excess water. The Bureau of Reclamation has tried to prop up Lake Powell by releasing water from Flaming Gorge Reservoir, hundreds of miles upstream. Moving water around is one solution in our drought, but it's not long-term. Is it sustainable? Only until we have the water to do so, and then the bank account is, is, is in the red. Experts say more permanent solutions require all hands on deck. Yeah, so it's going to take all of us. Okay. To come up with a solution, it's going to take all of us. Because Paul water. Brooks takes us into the Wasatch Mountains, explaining how snowmelt and runoff provides the West's water supply. This University of Utah professor specializes in water resources and says we need to update water infrastructure, both physical and legal, to fit a modern world. Everything that we use to move water around and all the laws are about 100 years old. And 100 years ago, things were very different. There were a lot fewer people. It was a wetter climate. Gabriel Lozada agrees. He's an economics professor who calls agricultural water use the elephant in the room, making up 80% of all water use in his state. So the main story of how Utah uses water is agriculture. He's quick to point out this isn't about blaming farmers, but he says the key to solving our water crisis is transferring more agricultural water to urban areas. And the best way to do that without hurting farmers is to allow farmers to sell their water to urban areas without losing their rights to the water. In the meantime, Lake Powell continues to shrink. 
Eric wonders how long it may be before boat ramps and marinas cease operations for good. I don't know at which elevation it becomes impossible to operate here, but it's, it's not too far off. There are also calls on all of us to conserve more water. You may have been asked to reduce the number of times you either water your lawn or wash your car. While it may help, many experts agree that we will never be able to save our way out of this water crisis. There has to be greater solutions. But just ahead, one community's hope for a miracle. And it's a place well known for miracles. I'll explain this photo coming up. You might call them the water police. In Los Angeles, inspectors from what's known as the Water Conservation Response Unit patrol the city for people overwatering their lawn. Those inspectors also respond to water waste complaints from people who call the city. Among the rules, people can only turn on their sprinklers for eight minutes at a time. In the first six months of this year, more than 1,600 people called to report neighbors or others violating the city's water restrictions. Finally, a striking example of hoping for help from a higher power. Take a look at this photo. It's from Chimeo, New Mexico. A statue of Christ hanging on the cross stands tall above the massive drought conditions below. Like much of the West, New Mexico is almost entirely in an extreme drought. Chimeo is perhaps best known for a framed church that has a reputation for delivering miracles, something people across the West may hope comes in the form of much needed fresh water. Remember to download the station's app to get the most current weather conditions. And remember, our team of meteorologists will continue to provide context and perspective on just how severe the drought is and what it means for all of us as we move ahead. Remember, the drought just didn't start this year, and it most certainly won't end this year for most of the West, which means we'll continue to search for solutions in the years to come. Hi everybody, I'm Reed Cowan from News 3 Las Vegas. We want to thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. Remember, you can always see more of our videos by clicking on the video links. And also don't forget to click that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on any of our YouTube updates. Thanks for watching.